Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to my channel. So the case that I have for you guys today is one that's gone unsolved for over 10 years now. It's a tough case because we don't know an exact timeline, so it's really hard to pinpoint when and where exactly everything happened. However, we definitely know enough to at least get an idea of everything that happened that night and to come up with theories as to how he disappeared. Also, a special thank you to the True North True Crime Podcast. I got a lot of information for this video from them. They did a great job of sort of of filling in the gaps that I was missing when I was reading articles and they are a podcast from Canada so I think they have a little bit more of a perspective as to the area and you know the things that happen around the area. So if you're interested in this case and finding out more I would definitely go ahead and give that podcast a listen. But before we get into today's video I wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to today's sponsor Albert. I've been using Albert for a very long time now, and it's for a really good reason. Albert is completely different than any bank account you've ever used, which is why I love them. Traditional bank accounts can be such a headache. They can charge $35 plus for overdraft fees, which has happened to me more times than I would like to admit, and it's so frustrating every single time it happens. And a lot of times, especially with savings accounts, they charge you money just for keeping your money in their bank account. And then beyond that, if you have any problems with your bank account, you're often sitting on hold for literal hours just to try and get a hold and talk to an actual person. This actually just happened to me the other day. Somehow somebody got a hold of my debit card information and went on a spending spree, spending hundreds of dollars out of my bank account. And I called my traditional bank account two hours before I went into work that day. And I was on hold for so long that I had to hang up with them. Otherwise I would have been late for work. So I'm not kidding when I say it took me literal days to try to find the time to just sit on hold and finally get someone to talk to to give me my money back and figure out this entire situation. The other thing I love about Albert is the ease of use and how they actually help you save money. You sign up for it for free and they make it so easy to sign up. Albert helps you by looking at your income and your expenses and it sees what money that you can save and then it automatically moves your money into a savings account, sometimes only being a couple of dollars at a time. But you you'd be surprised at how much you can save when it's just a couple of dollars at a time over the course of a couple months. As I told you guys before, I'm saving up to go on a couple of vacations within the coming years, you know, after I graduate and I'm done with school, and using Albert has helped me so much. But even beyond just saving, you can get up to $250 whenever you need it, hitting your bank account within minutes with absolutely no overdraft fees. They will spot you up to $250 from your next paycheck, and then you pay it back with no interest and no credit check. When you download the app, you will find out exactly how much you qualify for. Plus, the other great thing is that you can get 5-20% to cash back on purchases from places like Walmart or Starbucks when you swipe your debit card, and that money will show up in your account immediately. Who doesn't want to get free cash on purchases that you're already making? The other cool feature about Albert is genius. If you're anything like me and maybe you're not the most responsible and you don't really know how to save money, managing money can really suck. But Albert has a team of financial experts that they call their geniuses that will look at your situation and help you come up with a plan and then answer any questions that you have if you do get stuck. And I am so excited for the offer that Albert has for my subscribers. If you open a bank account and connect a qualifying direct deposit, you'll get $150. So make sure you go ahead and click the link down in my description box below and head over to albert.com slash Rachel Shannon to download the Albert app today. That's albert.com slash Rachel Shannon for a limited time, if you open a checking account and connect a qualifying direct deposit, you'll get $150. Thank you again so much to Albert for sponsoring today's video. Okay, so with all of that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the disappearance of Luke Jolie Durche. Luke Jolie Durche was born June 28, 1990 to parents Monique Durche and Rob Jolie in Temiskin, Quebec in Canada, and he had two sisters, Priscilla and Sarah. His parents described him as a very happy person who literally always had a smile on his face. He was very social, outgoing, and easy to talk to. Those around him knew that whenever he was around, they were going to have a great time full of laughs. He was very warm and affectionate towards those he cared about, and he was never afraid to go in for a hug. He had always loved hockey, especially the Florida Panthers, which is something his friends definitely gave him a hard time for. Growing up, Luke absolutely loved music, with his favorite band being Nirvana. 
He grew up playing guitar and piano, and he wrote his own music. He had dreams of one day having a career in music. He was amazing at what he did, and his family truly believed that one day, his music was going to make him famous. On the night of March 4th, 2011, 20-year-old Luke was up in North Bay visiting a friend where he lived at an apartment at 683 Sherbrooke Street. Now, Temiskaming is a very small town, and North Bay is sort of the next largest city to the north that a lot of people from Luke's hometown will go to visit. So the apartment that Luke's friend lived in was actually a house that was divided into different apartment units. So that night, it's a little bit confusing all the people that he was hanging out with, but I believe that he was hanging out with his friend, of course, who lived there. And then I believe there was one other male friend who was actually moving into this apartment soon. And then also present at the apartment, there was a couple, so a male and a female, who I believe also lived at that apartment, but in a different unit. Then there were three other girls there as well. I don't think they lived at this apartment complex. So including Luke altogether, I believe there were eight total people hanging out that night. Luke knew everybody in attendance that night, except for the guy who was in the couple with the girl. So pretty much he knew everybody. As far as I've seen, none of their names have been released for privacy reasons, so I know that it can get confusing, but I'll do my best to sort of keep everybody straight. So the plan for that night was that the friends were going to drink and pregame at the apartment and then head up to North Bay and go bar hopping downtown. However, that night there was a bit of a snowstorm and it was actually freezing weather, so definitely not the most ideal weather to be going bar hopping in. But they are from Canada and people from Canada or just anywhere in the north are built different, so I'm sure this wasn't something that they couldn't handle and hadn't experienced before. Sometime that evening, they all headed out to Main Street in North Bay. They walked there, which would have been about a six minute walk from the apartment. So they started their night at a bar called Blur Nightclub. However, one of the guy friends was actually denied entry due to how intoxicated he was at that time. But they did allow the girls to go into the nightclub, so that is where they stayed classic nightclub, finding a reason not to allow the guys to come in, but allowing all of the girls to come in. So all of the guys in the friend group decided to go across the street and try their chances at another bar called Cecil's Brew House and Kitchen, located on the 100 block of Main Street at the crossing intersection of Wild Street. They arrived to this bar at 11.54 p.m. on March 4th, and the group had to wait in line before they were being let in, and then Luke was the last in line out of his groups of friends. So all three other boys were were let into the bar, but when Luke got up to the door, he was denied entry because he was told that he was too intoxicated to enter. So it is a bit confusing, but the friend that was denied at the other nightclub was now let into Cecil's and then now Luke was being denied entry. Now there was security video or CCTV footage showing this entire thing. I couldn't find the actual video itself, but I have seen stills, which I will include. So after being rejected, he is seen turning left onto the bar's patio, but then he realized that he needed to turn right to get to the exit. So then he went down the stairs and then back onto Main Street. Now, as a side note, Luke's dad would later look at the footage and he was really confused as to why Luke wasn't allowed into the bar. He said that to him, he didn't look all that intoxicated. He's not denying that his son could have, you know, been on something that night, could have been drinking a lot and maybe he was intoxicated. He's not denying that at all. But in the video that he saw, he said that he didn't see him stumbling around, he wasn't falling all over the place or anything like that. To his dad, he seemed pretty normal, so he really didn't understand why he wasn't let in. So the podcast that I listened to on this case that I mentioned earlier, the True North True Crime podcast, they talked about an interview that was conducted with the bouncer who worked at Cecil's, who was the one who turned Luke away. So this bouncer said that he actually watched the group of boys head over to their bar after being rejected from the Blur nightclub, and it looked clear to him that one of the guys in the group was more intoxicated than the others. And he clearly saw that they were just rejected from another nightclub, so to him, it seemed like maybe they were just being belligerent, and maybe they were far too intoxicated. So when it came to letting each one of the boys in, he said that to him, Luke seemed to be the most intoxicated. However, the bouncer went on to say that he was genuinely surprised with how nice Luke was when he was denied entry. He wasn't 
argumentative or anything like that. He just turned away and left without putting up too much of a fight. But of course, looking back, the bouncer said that, you know, now knowing what would go on to happen, he wishes that he wasn't such a hard ass that night. He wonders that if he had just let Luke into the bar, that maybe he wouldn't have gone missing. So now going back to the timeline, after leaving Cecil's brew house and landing on Main Street, he then made his way to Zoom nightclub, which was right next door to Cecil's. He continued walking west on Main Street, where a bank CCTV footage caught an image that appeared to be Luke entering the bank with an unknown man. However, it's still actually not known if the man caught on this footage was actually Luke. I don't think police ever confirmed, and it wasn't like a video or anything, so it's not like anyone could like look at the way he walked or his mannerisms to see if it was him. It's just a still image of somebody who most people believe is Luke. So the assumption is, and the assumption that we will make based on this case is that this person was Luke, but you know, going through it, there is always the possibility that this really wasn't Luke. Given the circumstances and the timeline and where he was that night, it does seem like it was him. So apparently for the eight years that followed, this was the last known footage of Luke before his disappearance was him entering that bank but it later came out that police confirmed that he was later at another bar called Shooter's Bar at the Voyager Inn on Delaware Street. A bartender remembered seeing Luke there at around 3 a.m., now going into March 5th. The bartender said that he saw Luke and he was by himself, but he was socializing with other bar goers. Then this bartender noticed that he ended up getting a ride from another person at the bar that night but I didn't see anywhere if Luke had actually bought food or drinks while he was at the bar, and this will be important in just a few minutes. Now, the big question with Luke going to this bar was that this bar was actually located just over two kilometers away from Cecil's, which is only a six minute drive, but it's a 20 to 30 minute walk. That just doesn't seem right for somebody who is alone for them to walk by themselves in the middle of the night when it's freezing outside, when there's a snowstorm happening, being outside in the cold for 20 to 30 minutes. So did he end up getting a ride to this bar or did he walk all the way there? We don't really know. We do know that he got a ride from the bar like I just mentioned, so he very well could have just asked someone for a ride to that bar just based on the fact that we do know that this isn't out of the realm for his behaviors. So when we're thinking of how things may have happened, how things may have gone down, we have to consider how that specific person normally behaves. So personally, I'm not someone who would ever ask someone for a ride for something like this who I didn't know or had just met but I can't assume that Luke is the same way, everybody's different, and clearly this seemed to be something that Luke may have done, so it is possible. Using his own behaviors, again, he got driven home by somebody, so it's not crazy to think that he could have met someone at another bar that just wasn't picked up on CCTV footage, or he saw someone walking and said, hey, can I get a ride from you to this next bar? Now, by that next day, or I guess the same day at this point by March 5th, Luke's parents had tried to get a hold of him because it was actually his sister's birthday and they hadn't heard from him all day. Plus, they had actually planned to give him a ride home from the apartment that day, but he was not answering his phone. Initially, his parents were just gonna go ahead and drive up to North Bay to try and find him themselves, but as I stated before, there had been a snowstorm the night before, so they were delayed in going up to find him. They were worried, but you can't just jump to the worst possible thing happening right away. However, when they still hadn't heard from him by March 7th, they knew that something had to be terribly wrong, so that same day, they reported him as a missing person to the police. Monique, Luke's mom, also headed up to the Sherbrooke apartment that same day on March 7th to go ahead and try to talk to the friends that Luke was with that night, as well as look around the apartment to see if she could find any clues or any of his belongings. As it turns out, some of Luke's personal belongings ended back up at the apartment that he had started out his night at. The friend who lived there gave Monique Luke's dark navy American Eagle jacket that he wore that night, his keys, and his phone. He also gave her one of Luke's hoodies. I don't know if it's one that he wore that night. Maybe he wore it over to the apartment and then changed into his jacket to go out. 
I'm not exactly sure, but when he gave it to her, Monique noticed that the hoodie was a little bit damp and she didn't know why. Maybe something had been spilled on it, but even then it had been a couple of days at that point, so we don't really know why it was damp. Additionally, when Monique first saw Luke's cell phone, it was sitting on top of a speaker in the home and it had been dead at that point. So after getting Luke's cell phone, she brought it back to the home and it charged it back up and turned it on. After going through it, Monique found that the last communication on Luke's phone was a text that he had sent to his father that same day on March 4th at 8.51 p.m. In that text, he was telling his dad that he was going to need to ride home from that apartment the following day. Other than this, though, it appeared that nobody had attempted to call or text Luke that entire night or on the days following his disappearance. Days passed and even by March 10th, not a single one of Luke's friends contacted him to see where he was. Of course, his family was really confused and concerned at the lack of concern that his friends had for his whereabouts. Also, it stood out to me as something that was really weird that nobody bothered to contact him after he got turned away from the bar. I know that if I was with a group of friends and I got turned away somewhere, they would call or text me right away to see what the next plan was. Even if the friends really wanted to stay at that bar and I told them that it was fine, which normally wouldn't happen in my circumstances, but it could happen in a lot of other circumstances, I feel like it's normal to at least still text him to see if, you know, they want to meet up somewhere else later or to make sure that he gets home or something like that but there was no communication that night, so I actually do find that pretty weird that there was no other activity on his phone. Again, I feel like it could have been a situation where they got in and maybe they did offer to leave with him, but he was like, no, it's totally okay, like I've drank enough already, maybe I'll just go home. Or he said, no, it's fine, let me just go to another bar and I'll meet you guys there later. Either way, I feel like no matter what was said after, someone should have sent him a text that night to see like, hey, are you still at that bar that we're gonna meet you at? Or hey, we're going here next. Or hey, we're going home. Like, do you need a ride? Or something like that. But there was nothing. After getting these items, Luke's parents brought them to police. Police took his hoodie and his jacket into evidence but they told the family to hang on to his phone in case anyone did try to contact Luke. His mom could answer the phone and talk to them if need be. Also by March 10th, Luke's mom, Monique, went back to the Sherbrooke apartment, this time bringing Luke's sister, Priscilla, as well as a police officer with her. So when she got there, the guy who lived at this apartment had given them a key to the apartment so that they could come back and access it at any time. Apparently, he didn't always live at this apartment full time. It seemed like he worked back in Tamisking, so that is where he stayed during the weekdays, and then I guess he had this apartment in North Bay during the weekends. Not exactly sure why, but that's kind of how it was explained in the podcast. Monique reported that when she walked into the apartment on March 10th, it was a total mess. It looked like it still hadn't been cleaned from the night that all of them went out. There were open beer cans everywhere, there was broken glass on the floor, and the printer was literally hanging off the desk, just hanging on by its power cord. There were also candy hearts spilled and scattered all over the apartment living room, apparently still from Valentine's Day. However, despite this entire apartment being a complete mess, the coffee table looked very clean and orderly. And sitting right in the middle of this coffee table were Luke's prescription eyeglasses and then a Coors Light beer bottle that was open, but it was pretty much completely full. It looked like it had only been sipped out of. And then she also found Luke's necklace. This really stood out to both Monique and Priscilla because it looked like these items were carefully placed on the coffee table. When she asked the guy who lived there why he hadn't originally given her his eyeglasses or his necklace, he told her that he didn't notice these things sitting on the coffee table. So he said that they were either placed there at a later time or he just somehow missed them. However, when she asked the police officer who went with them if he was going to dust for fingerprints around the area, the police officer said no. So as Monique started, you know, questioning the friends and finding out what happened that night, she found out that the couple that they had gone out with that night, so again, I'm not completely sure if they lived in the apartment or in a different apartment. I'll get to that in just a minute. But either way, the couple had left on a road trip on March 5th, so the day that Luke disappeared, all the way to California. However, apparently this trip was cut short, allegedly, because the girl's boy friend was being mean and violent towards her. So that sort of made Monique raise an eyebrow as to like, 
who are these people? You know, is this new guy that he didn't know, is he mean? Does he have violent tendencies? What does this entire thing mean? Because again, Luke didn't know the guy that was in this couple. So did they get into an argument? Were they, you know, did their personalities clash or something like that? This is just something that sort of stood out to Monique and it stands out to me as well. However, I believe by March 10th, when Monique was at that apartment, they were still on the road trip. Now, going along with all of this, something that stood out to Monique was that when she originally went to the apartment on March 7th, the couple's door to their bedroom was closed, which made sense because they weren't home. However, when she returned to the apartment on March 10th, the door was now open. So I originally thought that this couple had lived in a different unit, but now that I'm sort of talking about it more and talking about this door, I'm not sure if they lived in a different unit. I think it was stated that way in at least the podcast or maybe an article that I read because I had written it down. But now I'm wondering how she would have gotten into their unit. So now I think maybe they were roommates. But either way, when she noticed that their door was open after it had originally been closed, this made her raise an eyebrow because why would their door be open if they weren't home this entire time? Just something else about the apartment that was making everything seem so strange and out of place. So again, I don't know exactly where this was going, why it stood out to her so much. Maybe, you know, she thought that they were lying about this road trip, which totally could be possible. They might have said that they went on this road trip when really they didn't and they just didn't want to talk to Monique. I'm not exactly sure. Again, we don't know who these people are. We don't know their personalities. We don't really know anything else that happened. So I don't want to jump to conclusions, but I'm just sort of trying to tie things together based off of the things that Monique had said. So next, that same day, Monique noticed that the people in the apartment unit above them were cleaning their apartment and they were moving things around like furniture. So Monique went up there to speak with them and showed them a picture of Luke and asked them if they had seen him. Reportedly, these guys said that they had seen Luke around in their group of friends, but they didn't really know him that well, and they denied knowing anything about what had happened to him the night that he went missing. But they did give Monique an address to a house that was located down the street. They said that this house was somewhere that Luke may have gone, but this house was known for being involved in drug activity. So Monique wondered if maybe these guys were just trying to steer them in the wrong direction, if something else was going on. They weren't exactly sure, but this was sort of random. She wasn't really sure why he would go to this random house that was involved in drug activity. Maybe he did, I don't know. She just really didn't quite understand what the connection here was. So they did end up going to that drug house to see if there was any substance to this tip, but they didn't find anything related to Luke there. Then by March 15th, 2011, a pedestrian came forward to police to tell them that they actually found Luke's bank card on the 500 block of Sherbrooke Street. Upon looking into his bank records, it showed that his card was last used on the day that he went missing on March 4th, when he withdrew about $20 from his bank account at around 2 p.m. Then by March 19th, a police team went to the east area of downtown North Bay. They used cadaver dogs and brought a bag of Luke's clothing to see if they could track his scent anywhere to give them any direction on where he may have gone. The dog brought the officers up to Main Street and then back around to Sherbrooke Street, but then the dog led them to Kingsman Trail, which led them to a park and a walking trail. They then got to an area of Chippewa Creek and they barked and indicated at an area, but when police looked further on this creek and in this area, nothing else was found. Then six weeks after Luke's disappearance, by late April of 2011, police finally obtained a search warrant to search the Sherbrooke apartment. Of course, they searched the unit that he was last seen in. However, they also searched all the other units in that building as well. However, as far as I've seen, police have not released whether anything of significance has been found, but obviously this was several weeks after he was last seen, so there was plenty of time for things to be cleaned or to get rid of evidence if, you know, anything happened there. So I don't know, maybe they did find something and they're just not releasing that. 
not exactly sure, but I don't really know what came of this search. Then going off of a tip, the search and rescue team sent out divers to search Lake Nipissing, which was near a water treatment plant. But once again, I don't believe anything came of this either. Now, later on in the investigation, a neighbor of the Sherbrooke apartment actually came forward to police to report that they did hear an altercation happening outside of the apartment on the night or morning of March 5th. The witness didn't end up looking out their window to see what was actually happening, but they did say that this altercation had to have been after midnight because it woke them up out of their sleep. They also reported that they heard loud music being played from a car that same night, but once again, I don't know anything further about this tip. Now, police have said that they questioned everybody that went out with Luke that night and they all apparently took polygraph tests, but those results have never been publicly released. I wish we knew more about what was said in those interviews or what happened, but we really don't know anything. By March of 2016, after this case had just sat there for years with no answers, the Ontario Provisional Police or the OPP joined with the local police force on this case to raise the award money. The reward money was originally at $10,000, but the OPP raised the award money to $50,000 and as of right now, I believe that is where the reward is still sitting. Over the course of the next decade, numerous tips and leads had come in and some were helpful and some were very unhelpful. It's actually really disheartening and frustrating to hear, but there were a few tips that came in that led police to wasting months and months of time. One woman reported that she actually saw Luke being beaten in his hometown of Temisking, and then she identified different people that could have been involved in this. This resulted in police spending countless hours conducting interviews, searching different areas, using dive teams, and all of that before this witness ultimately admitted that she had lied and made this entire thing up, which is just unreal and disturbing. She literally said that she just made it up. She never saw Luke anywhere. She never saw him being beat up, nothing like that. She literally just made it up. This woman was ultimately charged with obstruction of justice and wasting public resources and was sentenced to two years in jail and then one year on probation. Then the next false statement came from a woman who accused her ex-boyfriend of kidnapping Luke. However, police found out pretty quickly that this woman also was just making all of this up. She was also charged with making false statements and wasting police time, which I can't even imagine what would make someone want to come forward to police with a completely made up lie implicating people who had nothing to do with it and then get the family's hopes up that they're just getting so close to finding out what really happened to their missing loved one only to find out that they literally had just completely made the entire thing up. It's disgusting, it's despicable, it's ridiculous, and I'm really glad that they actually had to serve time because they deserve it. So that's pretty much all of the information that we have on this case. Now let's discuss the possible theories in this case. The first main theory is that maybe Luke had fallen into Lake Nipissing and had drowned. Now this lake is located just parallel to Main Street and it's only about a block away from Cecil's where Luke and all of his friends had started that night. So some people think that it's possible that as he was walking alone, he sort of got lost and turned around and because of how intoxicated he was, he was over by the lake and he slipped in and he drowned. However, those who are from the area say that that time of year, Lake Nipissing is actually frozen over, and if someone had fallen in and broken the ice, that it would have been pretty obvious. It also is apparently a very popular area for ice fishing, and those who live in the area say that if the snow or ice was disturbed, that somebody definitely would have noticed very quickly. So while this theory definitely seems possible, most people believe that it's not what happened because most people are pretty much under the consensus that if he fell in, somebody would have noticed right away. The next theory is one that Luke's dad put forward. So in this theory, it's believed that at some point during the night, 
Luke met up with someone that he owed money to and then went to the bank to withdraw this money. Like I said earlier, there was this still image of him entering a bank with an unknown man who was following behind him. But then once he got to the bank, maybe that's when he realized that he had lost his debit card. So maybe the man drove him back to the apartment to find the debit card because maybe he thought that he had it there, which again would explain how all of his personal belongings got back at the apartment before Luke left again. But then maybe as he was looking for his card, he went back down and told the man that he just couldn't find his debit card. And then after this, after, you know, he realized that he wasn't going to be able to get his money that night, he took Luke to another location and killed him there. Luke's dad said that this theory is pretty much just based on speculation based on what we know, and it does answer a lot of the unknowns from that night. However, what I do wonder is if this were the case, where does Luke going to that shooter's bar fit into this entire timeline? So that kind of brings me into the next theory. Maybe he didn't actually owe anybody money, or maybe he did. I guess it doesn't really matter for this theory, but either way, maybe he asked someone for a ride that night and then offered to pay for the ride, and that is why he went to the ATM. But then maybe when he didn't have it, he asked the person to take him home so that he could look for the card, and then he still couldn't find it. Maybe after he couldn't find his debit card at home, he asked the person if maybe he wanted to go with him to the next bars and offered to buy some food or drinks or something instead, but then the person ended up dropping him off at the bar because according to witnesses, he entered the bar by himself. Then maybe when he asked someone else for a ride home, this person took this as an opportunity to harm him for whatever reason. Or maybe it happened where he straight up asked someone for a ride from Main Street and this person said that they were going to another bar first, so he agreed to go with him. And maybe they didn't really know each other that well, maybe they just met that night and were talking and they didn't really look like they knew each other, so maybe that's why the witnesses said that he appeared that he came alone but he was chatting it up with other bar goers. Maybe this same person and ended up driving him home, hence, you know, other people saying that he saw him leaving the bar with somebody. Maybe this man dropped him off at home and then asked for money for the ride for bringing him home, and then maybe that's when Luke went upstairs to see if he had any cash or his debit card, and then came back downstairs and told his ride that he didn't actually have any money, and that's when an argument broke out. Again, the neighbor said that sometime after midnight that night, they heard an argument. So I know that when I wake up in the middle of the night, from a noise happening, I don't always look at my phone to check what time it is. You know when you wake up in the middle of the night and you're really hoping that it's not like six or seven o'clock yet and that you have time to go back to sleep and sleep quite a bit longer? Yeah, sometimes I avoid looking at my phone because of that because, you know, even if it is six o'clock, I don't want to know. I just want to go back to sleep and if I wake up five minutes later, it's whatever, but I'm still hopeful, so I just don't look at my phone. So this couple said that they know that it happened sometime after midnight because it woke them up out of their sleep, so maybe they know like, hey, I went to bed at around midnight this night, and then I was woken up out of my sleep at some point, but I don't know exactly what time it was because maybe they just didn't check the time because they didn't think to at that time. So that can explain for, you know, the discrepancies, if there is any, on um, when this argument may have happened. And then maybe during this fight, Luke got back into the car to sort of contain the argument so that they didn't wake people up from arguing too loud, but then the driver took things out of control and then drove away with Luke and did something to him. That's sort of a long-winded explanation for how something could have happened that night. Those are pretty much the things that I can think of, but we really don't know. This is all sort of just speculation at this point. Then the other thought or theory in this case is that maybe the friends or the roommates had something to do with Luke's disappearance, or maybe they know more than they're saying. Again, this is sort of just speculation on my end, something I'm sort of just coming up with. We don't really know who these people are or what they're like, and I haven't seen any other information overtly accusing them of anything. But just based on all of these strange encounters that Monique had with the friends, and then the fact that nobody reached out to him, and then this entire confusing timeline, that sort of can point towards them knowing more or something like that. And then, you know, the fact that this boyfriend who didn't know Luke from that night had apparently been violent towards his girlfriend. Maybe it was his personality and maybe something happened between them two and everybody else just doesn't want to say anything because they don't want him to get in trouble. Who really knows? Again, we don't know any of these people involved. We don't know what they know. We don't know how much they know. 
All we know is that no one really has come forward to say anything. No one really reached out to him to see if he was okay. And as far as I've heard from the family, they haven't heard anything from the roommates either or the friends. So I do think all of that is very weird and concerning. I feel like if I was with someone that night and I was with a group of friends and then somebody went missing, even if I didn't really know that person, even if it was someone that was completely new to my friend group and that I've never met before, even if I didn't really vibe with them very well or like them, I would still come forward to the family. I would still tell everybody what I knew to help bring this person back home. I wouldn't just let this family worry and not come forward with anything and not really confirm any timeline. So I think the fact that nobody's really come out and said anything is weird, but we can't just make accusations based off of that alone. We can't make wild baseless accusations just because maybe they acted weird. Maybe there's a reason that they're not coming forward. Maybe they've been advised to by certain lawyers, or maybe they just don't feel that they need to because they truly don't know anything. There could be so many different reasons to explain the weird behaviors and situations in this case, but there are some concerning things, so that is where I'll leave that. So those are pretty much the main theories that we have for what may have happened to Luke that night. I genuinely have absolutely no idea where I even lean, so I'm really looking forward to seeing all of your guys' thoughts in the comments. You guys always come up with ideas that I didn't even consider, so I'm really looking forward to the discussion that comes of this. Either way, it's been over 10 years now and Luke's family still has no answers. They are still so desperately searching for him just as hard as they were when he first went missing. I really just hope that we can spread this case like wildfire and get someone's memory going. Maybe somebody saw something that they didn't realize was connected to a missing person. Maybe somebody saw Luke without realizing that he was a missing person. Literally any information is helpful. Police have said that they have been diligent about taking in every tip that they receive and that they're following every lead. So again, if you know absolutely anything, please come forward with that information, no matter how small or insignificant something might seem. Any information is helpful towards the case and you never know. That little bit of information may have just been the puzzle piece that this case needed to finally put things together and solve it. I did see that the family has hired a private investigator on this case, and I believe as of this year, the PI said that he does believe that this case will be solved soon, if not within this year. So that really gives me hope that maybe they finally have some good information that they just haven't released publicly yet. I don't know, it seems like they may have something that made this PI come out with the statement that made him think that this case will be solved soon. Fingers are definitely crossed that this PI is right. Luke went missing from North Bay, Ontario in Canada on March 4th, 2011. He was 20 years old at the time and is described as being a white male with curly dark brown hair and brown eyes, a slim build standing at five feet, eight inches tall, weighing 150 pounds. He was last seen wearing a dark navy American Eagle jacket, a gray t-shirt with a purple logo on the lower left side, and and then dark blue or black jeans with a purple studded belt and a pair of New Balance running shoes with green stitching. He has a scar on his right forearm, which is thinner than his left, and he had braces on his upper teeth. Currently, it is believed that foul play was involved. If you have any information on Luke's whereabouts, please contact the North Bay Police Service tip line at 705-495-5555 or the OPP at 1-800-310-1122. Those wishing to remain anonymous can call Near North Crime Stoppers at 1-800-222-8477. So that is all of the information that I have on today's case. I genuinely hope that something in this case moves forward and finally gives this case that push that it really needed to finally be solved. It's been way too long for Luke's family to suffer without knowing what happened.
happened to their loved one. They deserve answers and they deserve justice for what happened. So again, please, if you know absolutely anything or even if you think you know something, please come forward with that information. But either way, that is where I'm going to end today's video. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to go ahead and turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Also, don't forget to go ahead and click the link in my description box below and head over to albert.com slash Rachel Shannon for a limited time. If you open a bank account and connect a qualifying direct deposit, you will get $150. Don't forget to go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions for a case that you would like to see covered on this channel, please make sure to go ahead and send those suggestions to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have a great week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.